And we are back, folks, with another edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider. We'll call this the late signing period preview. Late signing period has lost its luster since the advent of the early signing period, right? We get it. You know, all the buzz, all of the drama, all of the excitement now happens in December. At least, typically it does. This year is different because the top recruit on Michigan's board is still open and is going to be making his decision on signing day. Joining me to preview the late signing date and to talk about all the visitors that have come to campus, uh, that are going to come to campus, the impact of the addition of Kirk Campbell, new quarterbacks coach on recruiting, is my man, my guy, Bryce Marich. Bryce, how are you? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. A little snowed in. Um, so hopefully everyone's, you know, staying warm out there, but, uh, Sam, it's just the two of us today. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll have Steve back next week, right? Steve was, uh, otherwise occupied this week. Happens sometimes, but I want to remind folks before we jump in, if you like this podcast, be sure to rate it, be sure to review it, be sure to tell all your friends about it. You can find this podcast anywhere you get your podcast, Google, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, you name it, you can find it. Of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to like the video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way you'll get a notification every time we do a new video. And of course, if you want to be up to speed on everything that goes down, the michiganinsider.com is where to go. Had you up to speed every step of the way on the Harbaugh NFL dalliance, right? Last year and this year. Had you up to speed on the different assistant coaching searches, including this one with Kirk Campbell, right? We had Jim Harbaugh come on and say, I never talked to Brian Greasy. I was going to say, you had a you you had a pretty good source on that, right? Or am I off? He said, I never talked okay. to Brian I don't, He said, I never talked to, to T. Martin. To, to be exact, when I asked him about those two specifically, he said, didn't talk to either. I said, well, you know, what about the suggestion that you reached out to him through intermediaries? He said, that, that'd be news to me. Didn't happen. We kept you up to speed. And, you know, the Monday, the Monday of Harbaugh's announcement. Now, he was coming back, right? Thread running on the board over on the MichiganInsider.com. Like, hey, if there's movement on the staff, it's a thread that they started back in, I don't know, December. If there's movement on the staff. Here are some assistant coaching names you should keep in mind. At that point, I put a post on the board said, you forgot one, Kurt Campbell. I mentioned Kurt Campbell last month. Clearly, it flew under the radar. I want you guys to, so I want this to serve as a reminder that Monday night, last Monday night, that would have been on the 16th. So, hey, man, Harbaugh, Harbaugh is back. And if some, some things happen, a name to remember, a name to put at the top of the list even, is one Mr. Kirk Campbell. And remember this post. The very next day, it was announced that Matt, um, unfortunately for him, Matt Weiss had caught a case. But that was your signal. And who did he ultimately hire? As I said, Kirk Campbell. Look, so like I said, hey, you want to stay up to speed on what's going on, the MichiganInsider.com is where you should go. And one of the guys we have profiled all along, more in-depth than anyone, Nicholas Harbor, Bryce Marich. And this is one that I started on way back in the fall of his junior year, going down to see him. Been down to see him multiple times since then. And now decision day is finally upon us. He's going to be announcing on signing day. Yeah, so super, super, super long, drawn-out recruitment that I think it's kind of worn on us, Sam. It's, I mean, he's been, at one point I felt like a Michigan lean. Then at one point I felt like he's been a South Carolina lean. Now I feel like Oregon is kind of like, been like the trendy team and then sam all of a sudden this morning there's buzz about maryland (laughs) now in the mix so there's a lot to digest a lot to look into this um you had a and i'll I'll let you talk about this more but you had a very good point about kind of how you you're looking at the maryland buzz per se yeah so i want to turn your attention to last week so he runs that race, that 60-meter race down at Texas Tech, right, where it's just 
You see incredible. The, freak, the freakish athlete that is incredible. Nick Shortly after that, I guess it was on Instagram. The next day, he posts, "I'm in Boulder, Colorado." People, <laughs> yeah. people are going nuts, right? Like, what yeah. is going on, Coach Prime? And Coach, Coach Prime, Prime, Coach Prime is a he flipped Cormani McLean. I mean, yeah. he, he's gonna get some dudes there. So people were thinking, "Oh man, this is happening all over again." <laughs> you know, Prime is showing up in in Nick Harper's recruitment at the very end. Shortly after that, Steve Wolfong got in touch with Nick's dad. He said, man, Nick's at school. <laughs> I'm at work. <laughs> we're, we're back in the DMV. And so what do you make of that? What I made of it is this is a dude who is really enjoying the process. This is a dude who is really generating some buzz and some intrigue. You remember leading up to the early signing date? What happened with Jair Hill? You remember that? You remember Jair Hill? What? So take me back. Reset the stage of the Jair Hill recruitment down the stretch, Bryce, and what we were saying about Jair Hill as that decision time, as that announcement sort of a fast approach. So essentially with Jair Hill, a top 247 cornerback out of Kankakee, Illinois, um, last cycle for months, I mean months, it was between Michigan and Illinois, and it was a neck-and-neck race, and You felt like, all right, Illinois kind of took the lead, and then Michigan jockeyed back, and it was back and forth battle. Then all of a sudden, a couple days before he's going to make announcements, Sam, he releases an edit on Twitter. It has a top five, right? Everyone's like, all right, who cares? Well, Michigan wasn't in it, so a lot (laughs) of people cared, you know, and he, he, he didn't make any, he didn't do any interviews, he didn't talk to anyone after the edit. So it created a lot of buzz, a lot of speculation, especially towards me, Sam, which right. I had zero clue about. Like you're talking about the signing day special of, oh, what happened here with this guy and blah, blah, blah. What, what are you going to say to this guy? And I didn't know I was having freaking shots come flying across at me left and right. But I had put in a crystal ball favoring Michigan. A lot of other people, I think you, Steve, Steve Wolfong already had him in for Michigan. So people are saying, well, you guys are just bumbling idiots. How can you have crystal balls in for a guy that Michigan's not even the top five for? Long story short, it was basically a smokescreen. Created a lot of buzz, a lot of Michigan fans. We kind of, we told them, pump the brakes. Let's look into it a little bit. And then we just, we, we basically recommended everyone to still tune in to that announcement. It would be worth tuning in for. And lo and behold, what does he do? He puts, he picks up the Michigan hat, puts it on, and he goes, "Go blue." Uh, uh dude, take it a step further because we had, we had a live stream at the, at the announcement, you know, because I mean I was talking to people in Kankakee. That was one of my stops. Uh, you know, really hung out at the school for a bit. Went to one of the local watering holes with some of the people, and you know, kind of immersed in the people. You, you know, that's how you. You kind of grow your network, grow your sources a bit. And so I was talking to people the whole time, and they were like, man, it's Michigan. I don't know I don't know what to make of this, right? He wasn't really talking. And it turns out he wasn't even really talking to, to clink down the stretch. And so he pulls out the Michigan hat during the press conference. He said, hey, clink, were you worried? I'm like, wow. <laughs> so that dude was really trying to build it up, right? Really trying to build it up. It's funny now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's funny. And of all the people, and of all the people, he's going to pull a fast oh, rabbit man. on. Oh, I man. wish I was a fly on the wall at that phone conversation hey, afterwards. With I've, had, I've had run-ins with, with many coaches uh, before, and the funniest one ever was with Clint. <laughs> it was about, man, it's about 13 years ago now. That's my guy. That's my guy, though. But the, the way we met, it was not a friendly circumstance, man. Oh, I know. I know. I've my heard that. Is, I definitely heard it. Yep. <laughs> I definitely heard is, that story. The point is, hey, Jair, Clink gets to coach you, bro. <laughs> I mean, you got to remember that. You got to remember that. Anyway, uh, yeah. I say all that to say, look, it, we're talking about 17, 18-year-old guys, right? It's, it's. A lot of this is theater. A lot of it is fun. 
for some of them. And I think Nick, I think Nick is having fun with it. Um, that's not to say that he's a slam dunk for Michigan and none of these other schools have a chance. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but I think the, what happened with the Colorado thing, it, it, it exemplifies what I'm talking about here. When I say I'm not really, I, I still look at, at Oregon and, and maybe even more so South Carolina. It'll be interesting to see how, how Oregon leads this visit. Do they lead with NIL? I think that would be a mistake for them, right? Do they emphasize track? I think that, might, you know, kind of out front, I think that might be uh, a better play. I mean, I could say all this now because, you know, this releases after the visit, so after they get started, so to speak. So I'm not giving any giving away any trade secrets. Uh, but, you know, kind of getting to know him and get, getting to know his family and what I believe their criteria is, I do think Oregon has a shot, but I also remember Nick back early in the process had, feeling a certain kind of way about going all the way, you know, out west to the to, to rainy Oregon. Mm-hmm. Now maybe he feels different. Maybe he gets wild by the other aspects of, of Oregon. Nike can be very alluring, right? Uh, there, so it is. Offer, but I just feel like from a relationship standpoint, you look back east. And Maryland has it, but I even think that the 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 connection with South Carolina might be a bit stronger over time. And take it a step further, I think Michigan checks all the boxes that the others do. They have proximity to home, so to speak, with his mom being from Detroit. They have the alumni connection with his track coach, who's a staunch advocate. They win the academic battle, hands down. They uh, the football battle, they win hands down. Tight end usage, tight end wide receiver hybrid usage, they win that hands down. So the question then became, what do you think about NIL? Sounds like, to me, they they have approached it in a way that does not make that a deficiency, doesn't make that a disadvantage compared to schools who have had that be like a big asset in their in their recruitment like Oregon has been very out front with the NIL campaign and that maybe has swung the pendulum with some prospects but this doesn't strike me as one as long as you are competent in the space as long as you aren't you know just completely dismissing the the presentation because oh he's Nick Harbour and you know he's gonna get NIL wherever you go wherever he goes uh, I think you can balance that equation enough because I think it's a factor, not the factor. And then finally, track. And this is the one that if I'm Michigan, this is the one that I would have been most concerned about. And, and to a certain extent, as he heads into the Oregon visit, their facilities are second to none. Their track reputation is above and beyond. But what Michigan, and this is the point, that is track coach Pam Fish made to me in a piece that I pinned over on MichiganInsider.com, sort of laying out the feedback from his in-home visit last week where it's Jim Harbaugh, it's Ron Bellamy, it's Grant Newsom, and it's Sharon Moore. Basically, your entire offensive contingent goes in-home. And they spent a lot of time on track. Uh, you know, first saying, hey, there will be, in your freshman year, there will be a deference to your track pursuits he wants to run in the olympics in 2024 and everything that he does from an athletic perspective will will skew towards or will favor that so playing weight as a freshman will be conducive to him being in optimal track shape right and it's not like they were going to play ever play him on defense anyway but You know, ideally, you're talking about a a guy who's going to play tight end. You probably want him to be over 230 to 240 pounds, right? Which would be easy for Nick to do. I mean, Nick was, when I first went to see him, he was about 235, right? But is that optimal track weight? No. It's probably about 215 for him. That's going to be fine for him as a a freshman. I'm just giving you the feedback that I got coming out of the in-home of what, what Jim, what Jim Harbaugh was was kind of saying to him, deference is going to be towards track. We want you to be in the Olympics. Of 
course you're going to participate in football. That's not not like you're redshirting, that you're going to come in, get your feet wet. But we understand that down the line you might be 235, right? But right now you're going to be 215. And then in the offseason, in the football offseason, goes without saying. Focus is track. We know you are going to be strength and conditioning with the football team and, you know, coming over and running routes and getting over there and, and going through spring ball. Focus is on track at that point. We want you to be in the Olympics. So that that deference, that focus, that willingness to emphasize track, I think, is a huge factor in, in their favor. And then the performance of the track program. And this is the point, because, man, I don't know. I, I, do you keep track of the track rankings, Bryce? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you, I forgot. You not only were you a champion weightlifter, you were a champion sprinter too. I I forgot, Bryce. You know, I you know if, if Nick needs some pointers, I'm always here. I know Pam's hit me up a couple times for things, so really? you know. <laughs> so she's she's definitely my guide in track. Anything I knew about track before this really was from Stan Edwards, and in this recruitment, it's really been about from uh, from Pam, and so. She's been saying for a while, I don't think it's the disadvantage that people try to claim it is. Yeah, Michigan has some work to do, but it's not like it's impossible. And so her point at that at that point was track coach Steve Rajeski was, you know, there there were some things that they were looking to see. And she said point blank in the in-home visit feedback piece that I did. Whatever Coach Rajeski had to prove. He's proven it. And then some. You look at the women's team and the job that they've done, that they're doing, they're performing at at a at a at a top tier level. And she didn't know it at the time. She said, hey, you know, and they might be, I know the men are doing well too. Uh and, and so I don't know what their ranking is. Went back and looked at the ranking, and she said the men, Michigan's men, are ranked ahead of Oregon's men. And Michigan is in the top 25. So you have a track component that has raised its bar, raised its level. You have a football component that is showing deference to excelling in that sport as well. And so now you are offering him the opportunity to maximize his potential in every aspect of his recruitment. That was one of the things that he said to me. He said, I want the team, I want the program that is going to show me how. Don't tell me. You can come here and do this. Show me how I can do it in every aspect. Show me how you. I'm going to do it academically. Show me how what the plan looks like if I'm in football, what it what it looks like so I can excel at track. For the track program, show me how you, it, there's a buildup to the Olympics. NIL-wise, show me how that looks. Show me how all these things work together. And I think Michigan has done that. So me – my personal opinion, I think Michigan has the lead heading into this Oregon visit. If he had the Oregon visit behind him, I'd have a crystal ball in right now. But I, I can't put in a crystal ball before I get some feedback about how that visit went. You know you know me. I, for me to put in a crystal ball on a guy, I got to feel like it can't, it's not going to be undone in, in a win. I got to go at least six. At least six out of ten says – it's going to take more than a than than a you know a visit circumstance or a conversation to to swing it back the other way, right? So I, coming out of that visit is when I'll make my my crystal ball call. But if where do I think it's leaning right now? I think it's leaning Michigan, and I think the fact that you have everyone saying it's leaning a different way. South Carolina people say it's leaning their way. Maryland people say it's leaning their way. Oregon people say ah, this is closing time. About to get it done. Will Fong said it's leaning Maryland's way. I think that's the, exactly the way Nick wants it. I think that's the ex- exactly the kind of buildup he's looking to have. Someone's gonna be some someone's gonna be right, and multiple people multiple people are gonna be wrong. But when you add it all up, who's been there the longest? Who's built the strongest relationships across the board over that period of time? You got advocates in the circle. Mom and track coach, I think Michigan's the team to beat, Bryce. 
I mean, it's super compelling. I, I'll be honest. I did not know the track ranking. So that's from outsider's view. You would just assume prior Oregon's nine day better, you know, so much better in track and field than Michigan just because their, you know, prior history, what they have done, whereas Michigan, it's not as celebrated. It's not out there as much of kind of their history. Um, the only thing, and here's my thing too, the only hold up I'm really having with Michigan is more of Oregon, you know, because they've shown, especially with Dan uh, Lanning, the head coach there, that they can close and they can land some very highly touted guys the last second. And you do have the Phil Knight, you know, effect and impact there. You do have the nice facilities, but at the same time, Michigan has had relationships that date back, not for months, but for years. You know, it's not like he just came up to a game this season. He came up to a game two years ago. So if, I guess, if you put me on the spot, gun to the head, kind of where would I sit right now? I'd say 60% Michigan, 40% field. That's kind of where I would have it right now. But I, I think it's close. I really do think it's close. And like you said, that's why I don't want to put in a crystal ball, but that can change. That is not like a concrete sun stone, 60% Michigan, and that's going to stay there because Oregon can flip it. But it is very interesting of how many twists and turns, I would say last minute, this recruitment has gone suddenly because for the longest time, it's kind of been a slowly paced recruitment. You've seen little here and there. And next thing you know, his Instagram's blown up with Colorado. And <laughs> now you got Maryland. And now you got Oregon. And now you got just out of left field, all these schools. So it could be a big uh, smoke screen. It might not be. But I don't know if I'm personally buying, and I don't think you are as much, just the Maryland buzz quite yet. Uh, you know, one of the things that struck me in the early going of that recruitment is that I felt like their presence in the recruitment was born of, of two things. Uh, proximity. And he was really, really close to the assistant track coach there. That was his guy. Maybe the 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 coach that he was closest to at that time in his recruitment, I'm talking about regardless of, uh, of sport. The football program kind of seemed at that point, at least to me, like, it, like an afterthought. Mike Loxley has done a great job. Uh, you know, I think they have the the Under Armour pitch going. You know, between between Nike and and Under Armour, one of them. Is, I know who I'm picking. Yeah, I know. Well, I know offense. Yeah, well, one of them, both of them, probably say you can come design a shoe, right? I just throw that out there, Chino. You, know, you uh, know, they're throwing out something like that. But here, here's the point that was made to me uh, before. Think about this. Let's say Nick Harbor chooses Michigan. Well, let's say he chooses what is is South Carolina a, a Nike school? Do we know? Are they? Is South Carolina, I don't know. Let's assume. I don't know. Let's assume for the sake of argument that South Carolina is a Nike school. Okay. Right. So I, I just want to throw it out there, like it's not just Michigan. So he chooses one of those other Nike schools, and he goes he goes to one of those other Nike schools and does what Nick Harper does on the track. You mean to tell me? Nike isn't going to want to do a deal with Nick Harbor because he chose one of the other Nike schools. Come on, man. Come on. That dude can get a Nike deal wherever he goes. And if if Nike didn't want to deal with him, I'm sure one of these other shoe companies would be like, let's back up the, the Brinks truck. You talk about the, an elite sprinter like him? Stop it. Stop. So, granted, you know, it, it is it is on the table. It is readily available going to going to Oregon, probably. But is it off the table if he goes to another Nike school? Does anyone buy that? If Nick Harbour is what everyone <clears throat> thinks as an athlete, the issue, Nike isn't going to sign with him because he didn't go to Oregon. Stop it. Stop it. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, man. So... so Point being, I don't think NIL is is the deciding factor anyway. Just like I said with, with Dante Moore. And people, you know, they automatically assume every single kid 
NIL is the primary thing that moves them. It's right. first and foremost. It is for a lot of kids. And I don't begrudge the kids and the families for whom that is their, you know, their their checklist, their priority list. I'm just saying I don't think that that's number one in the pecking order for him. And because that's not number one in the pecking order for him, I don't think it'll it'll be the thing that swings it one way or the other. Just like I said with Dante Moore, and I'll repeat what I said last week. Was it a factor? Sure. How could it not be a factor for a kid of that ilk? But if it was the factor, he'd still be committed to Oregon right now. You mean to tell me when when Dillingham left, they said, oh, we'll take the we, – we're going to give you less. <laughs> we're going to lower the NIL deal because Kenny Dillingham – or do you think they probably said, you know what? You're thinking, you're looking around, we'll give you more. So you mean to tell me that you still think it was NIL that he left Oregon for UCLA? Or was that a factor in relationships – played a big role in it too and maybe just maybe the new guy he didn't feel quite as much as he felt Dillingham so let me look around oh he found somebody else that he felt just as much I'm feeling the same way with Nick Harbour when we talk about where it is in the pecking order it is a factor surely you have to register in the space but I don't think it'll be what swings it in the end we'll know soon enough as he makes his decision on uh, on Wednesday and if you know Michigan if they can swing it, it'll be another feather feather in their DMV cap because Michigan has been doing a bang up job in the DMV in multiple sports, whether it's Zaya Holman in track or or Dougie McDaniel and and uh Hunter Dickinson, right? Yeah, uh, you know, T Will on the mm-hmm. on the basketball side of things. You can throw in Joey Baker coming from down in the DMV neck of the woods, too. Uh, and then you look over at the other side. Look over at the at the football side of things, and it's just down the line, down the line, down the line from Blake Corum, right to Quentin uh, Quentin Johnson to uh, you know Nakai Hill Green, who is looking to make a comeback. Shamari Stone, young showy, not not older Shamari Stone, but young Shamari Stone, right? Chris Jenkins, you go down the line. I mean, DMV is a strong sh- Derek Moore. So many DMV guys. And, of course, women, when you throw Zaya Holman in there where, you know, you have that feel, too. So I know this is this recruitment isn't for the faint of heart. Very easy to get discouraged. I think he wants it to be that way. Not making you any guarantees or promises. I already told you I haven't put in a crystal ball yet because I want to see what the feedback is coming out of this Oregon visit. But I do think Michigan leads right now, and I feel pretty strongly about it. So we'll see how it goes. But. Speaking of, of of guys from the DMV, Michigan is 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 sort of moving forward with one is on campus right now, uh, in Aaron Childs, and that you know the interesting thing there is he went into the track program, in the same track program with, with Pam Fish that Nick Harbour did. They they went on the same day. They joined her pre- her track program on the same day. So let's build up to Aaron Childs. We'll talk more about him shortly. We got to start off first or finish off the 23 uh, discussion here with talking about Cam Brandt. You had some very strong uh, sentiments about Cam Brandt, as did Steve Lorenz, and so did I coming out of uh, last podcast. How are you feeling now with things closing in on signing day? So with Cameron Brandt, he's a 2023 defense alignment out of Chatsworth, uh, California. Currently committed to Stanford, six foot four, two hundred sixty pounds. Um, Want to say he's a three? He might be a four star, but a defensive lineman that Michigan's been continuing to recruit since his commitment to Stanford, uh, and a big reason why is because David Shaw resigned, and with that comes in a new coach, and then with that comes in a new coaching staff, and so he really had a very strong relationship with the defensive line coach at Stanford, who is now no longer there. Michigan enters the door, and they've been working on getting him up to campus for, I mean, for a very long time. And finally, 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 Sam, they got this guy on campus this past weekend. 
and from all indications and what he told our very own Greg Biggins on the West Coast, who does a great freaking job, was, I mean, he loved it. He loved it from the academics to the athletics to the strength and conditioning presentation by Coach Herbert, which has been a big vocal emphasized thing, which we're going to talk about with some of the 2024s that were on uh, campus this past week as well. But he really enjoyed it. And here's the thing. When kids and their families say academics are important, it sometimes come it comes off as like cliche. Like, do you really mean it? But if you're committed to Stanford, that means one, it's super important. And two, you got to have the grades because Stanford doesn't just accept commitments without knowing, you know, you're going to get into school there. So this kid fits Michigan to a T of what they want on and off the field. I'm, you know, he, so what he said was he took the visit. He's like, let me take a couple of days, kind of sit back, talk to my folks, talk to the coaches, you know, at home and let's kind of regroup and let me see how I'm feeling. From yeah. what I've heard, Michigan is feeling pretty good, but I'm still a little I'm I'm cautiously optimistic in that recruitment. That's the way I'm approaching it. I haven't put it in crystal ball, but I'm very much closer to putting a crystal ball in for him compared to Nicholas Harbor, let's say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm feeling like you know, you come to a campus that has two guys who just left the program that you were committed to, right? And you could you could kind of lean on them and talk to them about, wait, you guys are at Stanford and you decided to leave? Kind of thing. I, I think the the connection, the trend line is clear. And then you have the added bonus, like you just pointed out. Some kids, academics, lip service. But now that he's been exposed to not only high-level academics, but you pair it with high-level football, too. And you know if you stay at Stanford, I, they've had success out there, but you know it's a rebuild. You know it's a rebuild. Right. You're stepping into a program that's rolling right now. You're checking all the boxes, man. And you're in a position where Michigan has been churning them out. So, I, I mean, the tea leaves are reading very strong in Michigan's favor right now. That is another one that I'll be looking to make a crystal ball call on in the next few days. One that I've taken the crystal ball off because I don't know where he's going. I just think it's not going to be Michigan. So I've taken my crystal ball off Jamel Howard. Right now. Yeah. So six foot three, 320 pounds from Maris um, high school in the Chicago land area there in Illinois. It's the guy that was originally committed to Wisconsin. He decommitted once Paul, um, uh, drawn a blank in his last name. What's his last name? Paul uh, Chris mm-hmm. uh, is not the coach there anymore. Now it's Luke Fickle. But um, yeah, so he's the guy at the same school as Jimmy Roller, And he took a couple visits to Michigan this fall. Had a really good time. I think the sentiment there was, you know, he always had said he was going to commit the later signing period. But I think Michigan was hoping and pushing for maybe even getting him to sign that early signing period. That didn't happen, and now you got schools like Miami getting a visit from him. You got LSU, you got Illinois still in the mix. You got even Wisconsin, who's potentially he could go back to Wisconsin. So at that point, the longer this has went on, I just don't feel as confident there anymore. And I know we had all put in crystal ball picks for him to go to Michigan, but I think that was more under the stance or under the opinion that we thought maybe he would sign early, you know, because there was that chance. That never came about. Now he's looking at other schools, like I said, Miami, LSU, even Wisconsin, who I think that's a strong contender he could go back to. So overall, I'm not getting my hopes up on this one anymore. I did the same as you, Sam. I deleted my crystal ball pick for Michigan there. It's just, again, reading tea leaves, like you like to say, they're not looking so fresh for Michigan at that point. Yeah, yeah. Hey, but you know what? And it happens. It happens. Yeah, and you and Steve made the point last week that they weren't necessarily looking to take two more uh, linemen anyway. So uh, it's 
kind of an either or scenario and you wind up with a you know a lot more versatility i think jamel howard is going to be a real ball player uh but he's a nose guard and he's only a nose guard whereas you look at cam brant he's going to be up and down the defensive line potentially and so you know we'll see how it goes see how it goes like i said i'll be looking to make a crystal ball call on that on on uh on cam brant in the coming days with that this is a great time to have a pause for the cause let's do that right now we come back on the other side we will turn our attention to the visitors the 24 visitors those who came to campus last week those who are coming to campus this weekend and we'll give a word or two about our uh, our thoughts on the impact that kirk campbell having on the recruitment or will have on the recruitment of one mr Jaden davis stay tuned for more on the other side here by the Michigan Recruiting Insider. So, Bryce, the uh, the visitors last week, we had the great uh, opportunity to have uh, several of them come in studio. Uh, one of them, though, one of them that wasn't able to make it in studio was a young man who wound up pledging to the Maize and Blue. So take us into the newest addition to the Wolverines 24 class. So, Sam, I don't know if you've noticed, but Michigan has seemingly been doing a lot of work in the state of Ohio. Well, that continued this past week. Uh, they got a commitment from Cincinnati, Ohio, Saint Xavier 2024 defense lineman Ted Hamlin. Uh, guy, six foot five, 265 pounds. Michigan likes him at the Chris Jenkins spot. Um, a guy that can maybe move from the five technique to even the two. I uh, So basically saying you can move from inside or outside. They like his versatile, versatility there. Um, and interesting enough, his first game he played was against Loyola Academy, Brooks Bar, this past season. So he faced a current Michigan Wolverine um, already this past season, but really intriguing prospect. He's one of the top 10 juniors in the state of Ohio for his class. I know Allen really likes him quite a bit. I'm pretty high in his game. He seems to have a good twitch, good motor. Um, And we've talked about this looking at how they view defense alignment recruiting. They want guys that are big, versatile, tough, and have great length. And Ted checks all those boxes, you know. And on top of that, he's a high academic student who comes from a very prestigious high school as well. So you can't ask for much more. And it's another feather in the cap of Steve Klinkscale because he just keeps the train rolling in the state of Ohio. And I don't think he's going to be the only guy they get from the state this cycle as well. He joins fellow offensive lineman from Avon, Ohio, Luke Hamilton. It's the second guy in part of this five-man class so far. This is a great pickup, a guy I think that can develop and be not only a contributor, but a guy that's basically a stalwart up front for them in the years to come. Yeah, and it it just furthers the push in the state of Ohio. Uh, Brian Robinson was back on campus last week. We talked about Brian a lot. He's been on this uh, on this show several times already. He was originally slated to come back for Thursday's game. I thought it would be kind of a quick turnaround for him, especially with it being a nine o'clock game against Purdue. Uh, but sounds like he might be back on Saturday, right, Bryce? Yeah. So I caught up with him. Um... He said, first off, going back to his, you know, visit for the junior day last weekend, he said overall it was just wonderful as usual. He had a really good time with Coach Herbert, really connected with the Ohio guys like Ben Roebuck, um, Luke Hamilton, and Ted, and all the guys from Ohio, um, especially the coaching staff as well, Steve Klingscale, who is very familiar with him, being a Youngstown native himself. But – Brian told me, he said, you know, unfortunately, the weather has not been up to par. So that trip making up, you know, on Thursday was just, he was unable to do it. But he was like, I'm going to try, he would try to make it up for this weekend. And Sam, I, I you know, I posted some message boards that he's going to try to come up. And people are like, when is this kid going to freaking come in? Like, he's been up so many times. And I'm just saying right now. He's a kid that's going to want to take his time. He's probably going to take his visits. He's going to, you know, do his research on these schools. I don't I don't see him committing in the near future. But at the same token, 
I just don't see a lot of schools that are going to really be able to top what Michigan's offered and showed him so far. I mean, you talk about relationships. He's got you talk about visits, talk about distance to home. Michigan offers a lot of what he wants. And, I mean, you just talked to him, Sam. We had him in the studio, and if people could go back to Michigan Insider on YouTube and watch that interview we had with him in studio. He just fits Michigan and what Harbaugh looks for in a student athlete as well. Yeah, I agree. Checks all the boxes. Uh, and I think the more momentum they build up in Ohio, uh, the tougher it's going to be for him to resist the lure. He's already super close with, with Clink. Uh, he has guys from Youngstown that he calls family, DJ Waller, uh, you know, right? That is, it really, um, you know, he said, man, those are, you know, whether it's workouts, but he, he's like, man, that's, that's family right there. Yeah. So, you know, he's one of the guys that put me on Jason Hewlett. Jason, he Jason said, Hewlett. He's, he said, listen, you need to watch this guy. And he was up on campus right when he took that visit for the Illinois game. So, yeah, and Jason, like you said, might be, he is my pick for sleeper of the class. And so, yeah, but those are his guys. So it's, it's going to be tougher. For him to kind of to kind of turn it down, uh, but that that kind of if you missed any of that, I'm I'm gonna be doing a crystal ball piece or update. I think on Amarion Stewart, I think Michigan is trending up in that recruitment. Way up, yes. Where you been? Where you been? You're early adopter, you're an early adopter, but I think Michigan. You guys will see. I uh, Bryce already wrote a piece. We got video. He and his mom and his dad. They came by, spent a lot of time with them. Uh, so we'll have video with him up. We'll have the video with uh, Marquis Lightfoot, um, you know, Eddie Turk uh, as well. So a lot of content still to come. But let's let's move ahead. Let's fast forward now to the prospects slated to be on campus here this weekend and some big time. We thought last week was big time. Feels like from a rankings perspective, this week will be even bigger, Bryce. Yeah, so let's start off with running back recruiting, which, you know, a couple weekends ago they had Jordan Marshall from Cincinnati, Ohio, um, Archbishop Moeller, four-star running back there in the state of Ohio, come up. And Mike Hart has been targeting Jordan Marshall quite a bit. Well, he's got another top guy on campus who's already there now Friday, and Taylor Tatum, he's a top 100 uh, overall prospect in the 2024 composite. And he's one of the top running backs in the country, Sam. I mean, this is a guy that Michigan offered in late December. And a month later, they're getting him up to campus on his own dime. And Steve wrote a piece kind of, he, you know, titled it Emptying the Notebook. And talking with sources, he had put down that he has heard this is much more than a courtesy visit. You know, just because they got the offer, you know, he's not just going to show up for nothing. Like, he's seriously looking at Michigan – one of the things he's looking at Michigan for, too, is not just the football program, but it's also the baseball side of things. He's a high-level baseball player as well. And Jim Harbaugh has shown the ability and the love for, hey, if you're good enough, go play two sports. I mean, look at look at what they're offering with Nicholas Harbor, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you're good enough and you can handle it both, go for it. So that's an interesting dynamic, and that's something we're going to be keeping an eye out for. Um, coming out of his visit, Jawan Williams, he's kind of a newer running back, four-star uh, running back, kind of five foot 11, 200 pounds, shifty, dynamic, smaller built, um, but can bounce and has great bursts. And Sam, he uh, he comes from a school that Michigan fans might be a little familiar with. I don't know if you – there. it's in Maryland. Okay, I'm going to give you one hint. It's in Maryland. Is it in Baltimore by any chance? It happens to be in Baltimore, correct? Baltimore? I mean, is there a school in Baltimore that Michigan has been? They've gotten a player or two from there before. A player or two? Okay. St. Francis, would it? It would. There you go. Okay. Survey says that's the number one answer. Uh, but, yeah, exactly. So this is a guy, shocker, that Mike Hart is pitching as being in the next Blake Horn. And obviously right. that's, that's kind of what the kid would love to hear because – you talk about a selling point. One, he comes from the same high school, but two, 
look at what Blake has done since he's been in Ann Arbor. And on top of that, he's, you know, he noted to me, it's not just Blake Corum that's doing great things at Michigan. It's Donovan Edwards. Look at what Mike Hart's doing with the running back room. He's formed a really strong relationship with him uh, throughout this process. And, and this will be his first visit. And last but not least, I would say, is Aaron Childs. You kind of hit and add him. You talked about him little. Six foot three, 210 pounds. He looks like a, a creative player in Madden. I mean, he's physically impressive. He's a hard hitter. He can come down. And he's the guy that I think, you know, when we talked about Raylan Wilson a cycle of go and how just dynamic of an athlete he was. And he could definitely play special teams, probably even play defense as a freshman. I see the same with Aaron Childs. He's that dynamic of a player, that naturally gifted. He's got the athleticism, the size, the speed, the length. He's got it all. Um, and Michigan and George Hilo, the linebackers coach, has made him not just a top target, but one of the top guys probably on their linebacker board as well. They absolutely love him. I know he loves Michigan as well. He comes from the same high school as Chris Jenkins, so he has a connection with the program as well. And this is a trip that he's really excited for as well. So those three, and one more, and I'm going to let you talk about him as well, Sam. It's not just, you know, they're having guys that are juniors and even youngsters coming up from the 25 and 26 class. They also got a transfer that's a guy to watch as well, right? Yeah, man. Uh, so you you put me on the spot. I'm trying to say the, the dude's name. Well, that, I had to because I can't say his name. Let me pull up the, the phonetic spelling, right? So I, I did kind of try to prepare. It's Davidson. I know Davidson. I know that part. Come on, Bryce. <laughs> Come on, Bryce. <laughs> I know I know the Davidson part. All right, all right, all right, it's, all right, the, all right. it's the other piece. All right, so hey. I'm going to see if I can get this right. Uh, because we we worked on it to to try to get to the point where I could say the young man's name. So it's Davison Iggy Igby Nosen. Davison Igby Nosen. Igby Nosen. Hey man, it took okay. me it took me five years to say Giannis Antetokounmpo. So this is this by comparison is is a lot easier, but still I got to kind of look at it to get it right. So Davison yeah. Igby Nosen. Was, Sounds good to me. Was a top two four seven player coming out of high school. He's out of Jersey. He was an Adidas All American. Recruited by Kit, Chris Partridge uh, to Ole Miss. Now formerly the de- defensive coordinator at Ole Miss, and, the, and his secondary recruiter uh, at Ole Miss is now going to. He's now the defensive line coach at Rutgers. So both of his recruiters to Ole Miss are not there anymore. And he was very upfront in his announcement about him going in the portal saying, Hey man, with this uncertainty on the coaching staff, I, <laughs> I got to see what else is out here, man. I got to, I got to check out what's going on elsewhere. Michigan, of course, emerged as a, as a candidate for a couple of reasons, none bigger than the fact you get an endorsement from CP from Chris Partridge, right? Yeah. Who, who should I look at coach? Hey, if you're looking around, you might want to check out Michigan. Really good defense. Know the staff up there, right? They love Jersey guys up there. And they've been successful. Take a look. And playing time is right there. An opportunity to compete for a spot is right there right now. And this was a guy who started 10 games in the SEC. He's 6'2". He's 185. Very similar in, in stature anyway. To Will Johnson, you know, Will Will was obviously a higher rated player coming out of high school, and Will is a freshman All American too. Uh, but this this would shore up uh, in a huge way a position of need for Michigan. I mean, that, this is the biggest need to me. The biggest question mark heading into the year is who is the corner opposite Will Johnson. That's not to say that. You know, if he commits, he he locks right in. It just definitely ups the competition factor at that other spot. He would obviously play uh, and quite very likely start, but they don't they don't promise that. They don't give that to any guy. The big question with him is enrollment. He cannot enroll in a winter term at Michigan. Believe that window is still open 
at the other schools that he's looking at. You're talking about the add and drop period? Drop add date for Michigan, uh, University of Michigan, I believe was on the 17th. So he can't enroll in the winter term. He has to wait to enroll the spring term at Michigan. Is he willing to wait for that? Now, clearly, it's a possibility that he's considering because he is slated to take a visit to Michigan this Sunday. All right, so UCLA first, which he, that visit started yesterday. You, people can kind of see it on Instagram. It's supposed to be Ohio State next, and then Michigan. So it once was a time where if he was visiting Ohio State, you'd be like, oh, cancel, yeah, cancel Christmas, it's over. Not getting any gifts under the tree, right? But now, now after they played it, they got the you know got the tail whipped a couple of times. Show the 2022 highlights. It really got the doors blown off. In the secondary, I mean, just got cut up, eviscerated, curb stomped. I mean, drawing a quarter, rip limb from limb, giving a serious dose of act right. I mean, that secondary was terrible last year. And so could he, I guess they could sell him. You come be a part of the resurgence of our terrible secondary. Michigan's uh, pitch could be like, hey, you come and join a, a secondary uh, component that Man was coming on all season. Will Will got hurt. Will got hurt in the TCU game. I kept wondering because he remember he started the game. He was covering Quentin Johnson, and then next thing I know, I remember looking down and feel like, "Where's Will? Where's Will?" And he was going in and out of the lineup. The rest of the game hurt his foot in the game. Hurt his foot in the game. That's another one of those hidden factors uh, that after the fact you're like, "Man, that was a real factor." Point being, though, can you imagine that duo together? Two All-American corners with three years of eligibility left? Man. So that's going to be Michigan's pitch when he comes to town. And they, you know, they have a shot. If he was, if it was not, if there wasn't a chance that he, you know, just delayed enrollment, why even visit? He has, word is, A&M is up there for him. Um, Kentucky, Tennessee. Of course, Rutgers. His brother is at Rutgers. You know, so you can want to go home there. And then, of course, you got Ohio State and and um, um, UCLA in there. I mean, why not just go, if you're at UCLA, why not just go over to USC, right? I mean, there are so many other things he could do with that last stop other than stop at Michigan. If it wasn't a serious consideration enrolling for the spring term. And so this is a huge recruit. This is, this is, it's not Nick Harbour. In terms of significance to this class, but I think it's just under it. I think it's just under it. And in terms of what component of the 2023 class, when you add transfers in, like who is the biggest impact guy? I think most of us would say right now it's probably either Ladarius Henderson or, or Ernest Hausman. If you if you add the transfers into the class, right? But it'd be the Davidson Igbenosa. It, it, it'd be he. Oh, hundred percent. He'd be the guy. <laughs> he would shoot to the top of the list of impact guys, the biggest impact guy in the class, the immediate impact guy. I mean, in the class, will be Davidson Igbenosa if they are able to land him. So it is a Titanic recruitment going up to the late signing period, late signing day. He doesn't necessarily have to sign at that point, but still a huge recruitment to go along with Nick Harbor with signing day fast approaching also Cam Brandt. So first time in a long time, we've had some intrigue, intrigue in February, but you got not recruiting the class would be the top transfer in the class. And, and then you have a guy that you might flip a four star from out West that you might flip down the stretch as well. This is, this is going to set up for some fireworks this week. Well, and, and don't forget about a five-star quarterback, too. He's kind of important as well. Oh, yeah, I guess we do need to to offer a uh, a little commentary there. So here's what I can tell you now in retrospect. When Jim Harbaugh had that candid conversation with the Davises last Wednesday, and I mentioned that it was a conversation that put Michigan back on track – First, because Jim was very, very open. Like, there's been a lot of false reporting out there. We we highlighted some false reporting about, hey, they 
Michigan talked to Brian Greasy and he turned it down. And hey, they interview interview T Martin, false reporting, false reporting, false reporting. Same thing with hey, it's a deal on the table. Harbaugh is ready to sign it. False reporting. Hey, you know, it's it's, it's already been agreed to. False reporting. He laid it out to him, to the Davises. I talked to his dad about it. He said, Harbaugh told us, you know, he's looking for, you know, he's you just want to be appreciated. There's a way that appreciation is shown for someone who has achieved what he's achieved on the football field. He has an idea of what he what he wants in terms of the length of a contract. When I say he got candid, he got candid. I mean, Har- Harbaugh was not giving him, he wasn't giving him the media take. He was no giving, man knows the future. Yeah, he, he wasn't in that one. No man knows the future. He, yeah, he told them exactly what he thinks. You know, this is what I want. This is what I hope. And he said, you know, we're talking about it. We're negotiating. You know, things are are starting to move along. If the deal was done, he would have said the deal is done. Right? If he said it's sitting on my desk and I'm just waiting to sign it, he would have said that. Right? That that would have that been very easy to kind of move that along. That's not what he said. He said, we're working on it. Not there yet. I think we're going to get there. If he didn't think they were going to get there, he would have still had his name in the NFL hat, right? So, but that kind of honesty was part of why Harbaugh kind of moved that back into shape, right? That he said, don't listen to what the what the people in the media are saying about the deal's done, deal's not done, right? But we're going to get there. The other thing he said, very front-loaded question. Coach, so what's up with Matt Weiss? Now, he did say, no man knows the future there. He said, I like Matt Weiss. But, hey, I can't say what's going to happen. We're going to wind up with a good guy. But whoever we wind up with, Jay's going to get coached. He's going to get coached up. He's going to get coached up well. Coached up at a pro level. I'm going to be around. Matter of fact, I'm your recruiter. Remember I said that last week? He said, I'm your recruiter. But, see, now I'm filling in the gaps for you. Filling in the gaps for you. And, and telling you why and how Jim, with his candor, was able to get that back on track. So if Kirk Campbell, if the idea of Kirk Campbell being the next quarterback coach was a problem, guess who it would have come out? It would have come out right there. And, and let's say he still had reservations. You know who's a huge fan of Kirk Campbell? You know who was standing on the table for Kirk Campbell to get the job? Hey, man, it, it wasn't – you had a lot of folks inside saying, we want to see Kirk be the guy. So did QB1. So did QB1. And so who is Jaden Davis close to? Who is the Davis family close with? Aren't they close with QB1 and QB1's family? And QB1 and QB1's family like the new quarterback coach? And when they ask – QB1 and QB1's family, what they think of the quarterback coach, aren't they going to say, we like that guy, we push for that guy, we want that guy? Seemed to me to be a pretty good feather in Michigan's cap that they stayed home. And what impact will it be, will there be on recruiting? Look, Western PA guys, it's, it's, it's you know, it's a family. It's kind of like getting a coach from Detroit. You know, a coach from Detroit, he's on that, he's going to walk in, he's going to be part of the family. He's going to be able to recruit some of those guys. I feel like that I think it's West Allegheny High School, right? I, I think that Kirk is going to help sort of reinvigorate Michigan in the state of Pennsylvania. When they used to go in there, and they used to get dudes. Scott McClintock, Ryan Mundy, Steve Breston, right? Dude, Chad Henney going over to a different part of the state, right? Marquis Slocum at one point. Michigan used to eat in PA. Used to eat in PA. Right? So, hey, maybe it's not like it used to be in the days of Thai law. Right? Tim Massacoy down the line. Man, they used to eat in Pennsylvania. Some they, dogs. They some dogs. Like, I'm calling out about some dogs. I'm calling out all the people, man. Some uh... dogs in PA. So, is it going to be over? It's not going to be an overnight proposition. My point is, as they push forward with their presence in Illinois, which comes on the heels of pushing their presence in, in uh, or as they push forward with their presence in Ohio, coming on the heels of pushing their presence in Illinois, it feels like they're moving easterly. 
They got stronger in Illinois. They're getting stronger in Ohio. And they're setting the stage to get stronger in PA. Strengthening in the footprint. Strengthening in the footprint. So I know a lot of people there. It's like, oh, this, it's not sexy. That's because you bought into, you believe the hype. That it'd be great if it could have worked out with Brian Greasy. You don't make, make no mistake. Love Brian. Love Brian. Doing an outstanding job in San Francisco. The minute I heard that, I, was, I doubted the, the veracity of that. I mean, you just got to kind of, you know, kind of know something. That just never made sense. <laughs> and it never made sense for for that marriage at this point in time. You know, I think, you know, I think Brian's going to be a head coach. Um, before, so, oh. before all is said and done, I'm talking about it. Okay. In the, pros and the pros oh okay 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 and t martin that kind of made sense but i was because of the ravens thing he was quarterback coach he he uh was a good recruiter it was plausible because of the ravens uh connection as jim said he never talked to him and i was hearing as i was doing some digging and one of the things that made me reach out to jim was i was hearing that miami was in play that you know it was looking like gaddis was going to be out they were going to be looking for a receiver coach right that that his son is a baseball player at Miami and that Miami was in play. So at that point, I'm like, you know what? Let me reach out to Jim. Let me ask you, hey, Jim, it's being said everywhere. You talk to Brian Greasy. You talk to T. Martin. He said, man, I didn't talk to either one of them. <laughs> I didn't talk to either one of them. I said, well, you know, they say, well, maybe you reached out through an intermediary to Brian Greasy. He said, nope, be news to me. So again, Jim Harbaugh, Getting back to Jaden Davis, offering him some candor, laying out what's what, being very honest and open. And I think he put Michigan back in the driver's seat for Jaden Davis. And so now it's about a uh, timeline. They were set to sit down as a family and talk about that. And how about this for a tease? We'll get into that early in the week over on the MichiganInsider.com. And I'm telling you, the days leading up to signing day, there's going to be no better time. You've been waiting for an opportunity. You've been sitting on the fence. I'm giving you a little pre. I, I'm, I can't say what I want to say right now. Uh, it's not about, you know, someone about to commit. It's about what an opportunity is going to be coming up. So I'm, you know, kind of spilling some beans that I shouldn't spill. Right. But there's going to be some great opportunities early next week. If you've been sitting on the fence about the, getting on TMI you to jump on great time best time of the year for you to do it just letting you know and they're gonna there's gonna be some heat there's gonna be some absolute heat content wise that you want to check out as well including an updated conversation with the davises i'm just teasing it a lot more to come on the michiganinsider.com so bryce as always young fella great job appreciate you you know, we got some more shoots to do in the studio, so you can find that on the pot on the uh, on the YouTube page, just like you can find all of these episodes. If you like the video, be sure to like it with the button. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. That way, you get a notification every time we do a new video, and you help us go and grow. And then the same thing if you're listening to this on the podcast page. Be sure to like it. Be sure to tell all your friends about it. They can find everything in their podcast: Google, Stitcher, Spotify iTunes, you name it. And finally, last but not least, I want to remind you, you want to know where it all goes down, where you can find all our videos, all our podcasts, all our content, VIP message board, VIP intel, accurate VIP intel, the MichiganInsider.com. No better time than the present to get on board. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on the next edition of the Michigan Recruiting Insider.